So we're all going to... Um, you've had electrical lab, haven't you? Yeah. Yep. So that's technical. This is conceptual on the electricity concept for the whole, the whole building. Uh, all of, and, and it, it really breaks down into two, two thoughts there. Uh, the electrical concept for the basic global model airships, global or vaulted global, which are, which is an electrical system that is, that is uh, an electrical system that is uh, similar to what it takes to run a conventional home. You know, that's that's what a that's one of our electrical systems, and this uh, this is going to go into the concept of that, um, not the technical aspect of it, but the concept of it. And then our other electrical system, which you've heard about already, and I've talked about too, is the simple survival electrical system, which is just another whole concept in minimizing the use of electricity for uh, purposes of not having to spend a fortune. So. Uh, uh, and obviously the electricity concept uses, uh, you know, encounter with earth phenomena, which is really, I can't talk about that enough because we're, we're trying to encounter, not harness, and encounter, not recreate, like in a nuclear power plant, they're trying to recreate the sun and doing a foul job of it. And then a lot of buildings, the, 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 this is incorporated into the buildings, so you're seeing how the sun and wind uh, encounter is built into the building in every case. And uh, these are just buildings that do that. There you see wind and sun. Um, these are our old adjustable panels. And that's the, the hive is here now. The hive destroyed this building. Uh, and uh, more of the same uh, panels uh, always built into the configuration of the building, making the point of decentralization constantly for housing equals utilities. And so we're looking at solar, solar wind, electricity, which doesn't rule out other things, but it happens to be what we use mostly. And uh, here we have the panels built into the building, and we have a lot, you'll see a lot of these propeller type windmills around the community less and less as time goes on though because they're noisy and they break every 18 months. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't really uh, like them anymore. So, uh, where we started with all of this was uh, the turbine building out on the Mesa and we, we had photovoltaic panels but we also, we wanted to <coughs> not uh, be dependent on the the photovoltaic panels in those days and still because well, we, we're using them a lot more now but the, the oil companies were making the photovoltaic panels and that just put us in another state of oil you know uh, BP, BP solar BP uh, petroleum British petroleum makes solar panels they're a big manufacturer but other companies make them now that aren't involved in oil so anyway, we wanted to make our own power, so we made this homemade vertical axis windmill, venturing the, the wind into it. It worked great. For, it spun for 22 years with no maintenance. The blades finally blew apart, and we haven't replaced them, because now the wood is going away. We're going to have to take the whole damn thing off and either redo it or leave it off of that house. But for 22 years, with no maintenance, that thing worked. And so it sold us on vertical axis windmills, yeah. Uh, but how much power did that produce, roughly? Um, I had it pegging a 50 amp meter, is all I know from those days. Uh, so 50 amps is, uh, how many watts is 50 amps times 12? Uh, yeah, three panels worth. So, uh, so then, that's right out here, we had a larger propeller type windmill, uh, and a tracker rack of panels, you know. This, this is just showing you what we have gone through. And if we've gone through it and blown it off, well, chances are it's a pretty good reason. Uh, 
So we had a big, I don't know, 500k, uh, 5k uh, windmill and a tracker rack based on advice and everything from various electricians and all. You don't see either one of them out there now. Uh, that's because this thing blew apart twice and finally they wouldn't fix it again. And this thing blows out of the wind whenever, I mean blows out of the sun whenever there's a good wind. And uh, then it starts cranking up its tracking. In the winter, it has to thaw out until 11 o'clock and then it freezes again at 1. I mean, so, I, in my opinion, trackers are worthless. They cost a bunch of money and I'd rather put the money into just a couple more panels. So we had a tracker and a bigger windmill there, and they're, they're gone, and that's a, there's a good reason for that. So we, we played the tracker <coughs> game upon the advice, you know, you're going to be tracking the sun so you can have less panels. Well, that works unless there's cold weather or unless there's wind. So for me, tracker racks are, uh, we had one down at the well, and it blew apart. The panels just blew completely off. So, yeah. How long ago did you have that tracker? This one here? Oh, it's been a few years now. They probably got some better tracker <coughs> stuff that that tracks better, uh, that doesn't blow out of the wind. Uh, I've seen some of the new ones that have some kind of ballast on them that keeps them from blowing out of the wind. But still, it's just like uh, it, it's more industrial maintenance type stuff. And so where we went was we said to hell with the trackers, and we made our own. So see, when you track the sun because it goes from the east to the west, but then you have to track it winter and summer. High summer, low winter, you have to do that. And so we said, okay, we're not going to worry about the east and west, we'll just buy a couple more panels with the money we saved by not getting a tracker. And then we'll just track summer and winter with our own homemade tracker racks, which worked great. Um, but you have to climb up on the roof two times a year and adjust them. And you know, you got some 50-year-old woman climbing up on a pro panel roof in the winter, busting her ass and suing us. So, uh, we, we did that a lot, though. I mean, I've fallen on my ass on the pro panel roofs with snow on them. It's for sure uh, not safe. But these things just slide up and back. It's real easy. They work good. You get your full summer angle here. You paste it back up for your winter angle. It's done with wing nuts. They worked great. But then we looked at that. And we said, okay... Each one of these little tracker, you know, adjustable assemblies costs 200 bucks a piece. Well, hell, you can damn near get a panel for that these days. So we blew them off. We didn't blow them off until we used them a hell of a lot. That's one with the winter angle. There's your winter angle. And see, it just slides out for your summer angle. It's great. It worked good. But why spend that $200, $400 worth of tracker? bullshit there, and could just get another panel. So, we used them a lot. It took, it takes, we're slow learners. It takes us a long time of doing the wrong thing to finally go, whoa, you know. So, we do eventually learn, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, I noticed we had them situated to you, uh, apart from this additional solar gain of having them pointing straight up in the summer, it also shaded the the greenhouse, the way they slid out. Yep, that was kind of cool. Is it significant at all? Or well, it helped. We noticed that. But also here, look what else they do here. Oh no, this is in, not this building, but some of the buildings, they shaded the gutter yeah. in the wintertime and let the gutter freeze. So there's all kinds of little deals. But look how many, look how many of them we got here. Here they are here. Uh, here they are here. They're all over the place, the tracker situation. And and it took us a long time to learn. But here's what we saw. Okay, here's your summer angle. Here's your winter angle. Just go for the middle. Put them on permanent. Never have to touch them again. I mean, having to adjust panels when you got as many buildings that we're responsible for. I mean, Jesus Christ, the adjusting of panels could be a full-time job for somebody. <laughs> so you got to get it easier. So we just go 45. Are we? If we're in a different part of the world, we'll go for the the. Um, Winter sun angle, summer sun angle, find the average between the two. And you're not, you know, you're going to get, what, 7% less, 7% less in winter and summer, and full in spring and fall. No big deal. 
and you just say, okay, I take all the money I was putting into tracker racks and adjustment racks, put it into more panels, paste them onto the building, and you've got uh, uh, trouble-free power. So I talk about everything in terms of the global model earthship because it's our baby. So the global model earthship was designed then to have a 45 degree, which is what that is, roughly. Uh, here's your winter, here's your summer. Panel place built into the building. So there, that, that, that defined and designed that truss that we use that you are getting ready to put up over there. Why we designed that truss that way was to, I think you, you had the question of why don't we do vertical face, blah, blah, blah. See, I'm pinching it in with a little bit of an angle to have smaller air volume here. And then when I get up here, I want we made this truss specifically so we could cap the greenhouse and give us a place for our panels. And it didn't really block, if you plot the angle, much of the winter sun coming in. So that truss was designed for electricity and solar hot water. The, 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 the absorption panels of power and water are on this 45 degree slope, which gets the best of all worlds and perfect uh, world in the spring and fall. So that's again the global model earthship's uh, application of this. Everything about the global model earthship is is for a reason. You know, it's for it's for having made uh, you know 400 mistakes and finding out that it's the best way to go. So there's a global model earthship. Panels on its little, this is the power part. You can add, lots of people add panels, and it's your power part. This is your heat part. This is your ventilation part, and so on. Uh, these, these breakouts to the east, you'll see a lot of them. Um, pain in the ass, expensive, and condensation. Uh, I wouldn't advise it. Uh, but you'll see it on a whole lot of them. Again, it took us 14 of these to figure out that that's not the thing to do, yeah. Uh, put the grass so on the, the off topic, so, um, But do you ever use? Yeah. Um, um, gets I was under the understanding that evacuated tubes were so more efficient way. for heating the water than the flat panel way. ones. I mean, I know you have like a ton of sun here, and so probably the flat panel ones work awesome. But do you ever use them in other climates or anything? That we've used the evacuated tubes. The German, uh, yeah, they're they're intense. Uh, here, I, I don't use them. Be, uh, because they think that they blew up here. We get so much sun that it just wasn't necessary. These are the, the, the flat plates are cheaper and easier. And for our purposes here, they and oh, see, we don't use them for. We don't need them that bad. We need them for domestic hot water. And frankly, I don't care if we get the domestic hot water hot enough to take your skin off. You know, that's what we do in this country. Uh, we. Uh, and in a lot of developed countries, we heat water to the point of it scalding you, and then we cool it back down so we can use it. So, I mean, like, you know, where is that? So, um, so I'm, I'm not into needing, I don't need to heat the whole building with these uh, evac tubes or whatever they're called. And we got a building here with them on it, but we have to keep that thing down, man. It'll, it'll, it'll fry the whole building. I guess the only place that'd be that would be valuable is if you don't have a lot of sun days. If you water. don't have a lot of sun, it's the most effective, efficient way to get some heat out of that sun. And then, then they function and hook up just like these other panels. The, the, another mm -hmm. thing uh, that kept us from them uh, is uh, after we used them once, we got our space up here. You know, we got our four, and a, four foot six inch or four foot four inch space. They're all ling linear. And you can't put them, I don't think you can make them work sideways. I haven't tried it. But we, we uh, you know, they haven't made it into our realm of uh, using on a repetitive basis for various reasons is the point. Nothing wrong with them. Uh, so power-wise, that's our power space on the global model airship as well as our hot water space. And so that's the reason that we don't use tracker racks. That's the reason that we don't use... The adjustable racks, we put them on a mean temperature angle, put a little bit of money into buying another panel or two, and call it good, yeah. He's a, you call those the UVAC tubes? No, no, he's on talking the about oh, the sorry. UVAC. I'll show you. The thing Here's what he's talking about. Very big, at the very beginning. Uh, there. There's the UVAC tubes. See them? Yeah. 
And they're intense. I mean, that, that thing turned to steam one day, and we melted all the pipes and everything. It was crazy. It, that thing's hot. It works now. It's, they're good. They're more expensive, and they, re, they require more space, so we evolved out of them. And, you know, it did, but it does show you we have used almost everything and have a re, when, when something's really good and really appropriate and really works for our concept of a global model, we, we don't leave it. So, sorry, I was using the wrong term there. You said the things that have the condensation on the ends. Oh, the, 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 the rooms. Yeah. These additional vaulted opening up to the east or west spaces as opposed to just like the building you are building just has two airlocks on either end, boom, done. And, the, and you'll see that, in, you could go see that in operation in the one that they just finished. That is the best way. When you do this open around to the, uh, uh, this is off the topic of electrical, but when you do this to the open out, you know, and you have your greenhouse here. Damn, I can't even draw the day. Uh, so, it, they usually do something like that. This space, uh, still haven't drawn it right. Like the corner cottage. Like the corner cottage, like... Uh, that's the only one we've got here. Do, doing that. What happens is, it's very cold out here and very warm in here. And if condensation happens, it catches on the front face windows and rolls down into the planter. No big. But it doesn't happen much because the sun fries it off. But over here, sun comes up in the east and leaves. It's still super cold out here. It's still super hot in here because of this air drifting over to there. And you got such a temperature differential. This place just, you know, look at look at the EdFac, the visitor center over here. And all kinds of mold and wet and dampness. They got a fan going. It's just a pain in the ass. Um, it, it, you know, the solution is do another airlock out here. And if you do an airlock out here, then that stops it from happening here, and it blocks this hot air from getting out there. But three airlocks, I mean, is it really worth it to do that? So. That's the, that's the rationale there uh, for uh, those things being a pain in the ass, basically. Uh, so I don't advise it. People want them. They want to get a view or something. Well, what you have to do is build three airlocks out there, three faces. So we get our power. We've talked to them about why and what on panels. Panels keep getting bigger and more, you know, more uh, watts. Like we were using, we, we started out using 30 watt. And then we graduated to 51 watt, then we graduated to 120 watt, then 150 watt, then almost 200 watt, 200 watt, two tens, two, we got 250s now. And I, the bigger the better because it's less connections. The less connections you have, the less connections you have to get loose and give you a problem. <coughs> and so we, we go with the big 250s now and... They really, they do it, and panels are supposed to last, I mean, the ones out there on the well out at the castle compound are dying. They're putting out about half, but they, they were early panels. Uh, I don't know if they're getting worse or better, but those panels are 30 years old, and they're half mass now. So panels are going to last quite a while. The newer ones may last longer, but you, in, in the new panels you still get some like Kyocera, every once in a while gets a batch that goes bad, and uh, and they do reimburse you for them or make a, make good on it. But all the panel companies are selling each other back and forth and whatever. Sometimes you don't get you're not in line for a guarantee. But anyway, the the 250 watt panels is what we use. Uh, we use Kyoceras, we use Shot. Uh, I think we're using Hyundai right now because. Shot sold all of theirs, you know, they're selling these things right and left. They sold all theirs to an industry. So anyway, you got your power coming in. Now you have to organize it and get it ready for your house. That's why we call the, this is an early POM, power organizing module. You have to make one. You have an inverter, and you have a brain, and you have AC and DC circuit breaker panels. Now, there's a point in the concept right there of what we do. We have, if you get to a solar, if you get the advice of a solar technician, they will advise you to invert your whole scene. Invert it all to AC and then run your house normal. 
So here's the downside of that, and we have been there and don't like it. You invert your whole house to AC and you've got a typical house. It's all wired typical. But your inverter blitzes, and they do. I've had every kind of inverter. Some card will go bad, some, some circuit will fry. Your inverter is down. Your whole house is down. You can't even flush your toilet. You're, you're cooked. Uh, so no lights, no toilet, no refrigeration, no water, nothing. And we have been there. So uh, we, and, and if you invert your whole house, your inverter has to be pretty good size, and that's expensive. And pretty good size inverters, bigger inverters, break more often than smaller inverters. So we then came up from, from doing it the hard, you know, learning the hard way. We wire the house DC and AC. So we got a DC circuit breaker panel and an AC circuit breaker panel. On the DC is pumps for the toilet, pumps for the water, uh, uh, pumps for the gray water, yeah, and uh, refrigeration, and some lighting. And so that if the inverter breaks, you still have a life. You can still do everything. You just have less, less uh, appliances and things, yeah. Is there, would you say it's more expensive initially to have the two different systems? Nope. Not, not really significant at all. You got to do an, an extra $75 panel. Um, the wiring is a little more expensive DC than AC because it's fatter wire. But it's like you're talking a few hundred dollars. You're just not talking enough. And then you save that by being able to get a smaller inverter. So it's, I was just wondering if the difference in price would warrant having a backup inverter and then well, a backup inverter is a couple grand, you know, so it's not really, and then you got to wire it in and all that, so it's, it's, I like the direct DC pump refrigeration and some lights, just because it's direct, it doesn't go through an inverter. There's no, you know, inverters lose less and less, but they're down to maybe 5% efficiency now anyway, yeah. Why not just go all DC? We done that. That's a pain in the ass too, because then you got to get DC TV and DC blender, uh, and you know you got to get DC appliances. And then uh, in there for a while, it was harder to get the DC efficient bulbs. The bulb technology is going. We can't even keep up with it. So it's it's kind of to 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 blow off the inverter for a certain part of the house, and to have the inverter for the other part is still a valid thing. Uh, I like it because it, you're safe, you're secure. Uh, and so we, we do it that way still. But it is, uh, see then, then you can get by with a pretty small inverter, DC, AC, now it's 24 volt DC and AC, and the brain. And these are the old days, the gauges are, what they call them, analog gauges that you can read rather than this stuff like my watch, which uh, is difficult. For people who are retarded. So um, now this it keeps evolving. We're getting into the outback stuff, which we're getting out of now. Like I say, this industry you just can't keep up with it because outback has quit evolving, is the is the word on the street, and uh, other companies are evolving. And uh, outback has got this thing that I really don't like, where you have to press these in different ways to get a readout. Now we just got the ones we got over at the new Lone Tree House. It's just you got a readout. You go in, you open the door, and there's your readout. You don't have to go try to find it and then screw it all up and maybe set it up so it doesn't charge. Uh, then you got your brain, you got your inverter, and uh, your DC and your AC circuit breaker panels. And that's the reason we discussed in the reason. So this is just various versions of that situation. We make these with every house. Sometimes we ship them with every house, and sometimes we sell people these by themselves. Yeah. What does the brain do? Uh, it it disperses it to the different circuits, to the different panels, to the inverter. It just kind of splits it up. It, it's kind of the organizer of everything. Uh, it's it, they don't really call it a brain. They call it a, <laughs> some other technical term for it. I call it the brain. We just haven't really talked about that or seen that yet. Oh yeah. Seen I'll get one of the techie guys a, to to give you, like Chris, to give you a, a run through on what goes on in there. Because everything comes in there. You know, there's where you can flip off all the power. You can flip off different parts going to there, 
DC to AC. The green one is flips off the panels charging. It kind of is the main control center to then get it to the inverter or get it to the uh, 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 circuit breaker panels. So it's, it's a component that is needed. So that, that power organizing module then goes in the hallway. We call these the power cabinet and the water cabinet. And it, it used to be four feet long. And one, just a few uh, buildings ago, I was out there and we had the battery box on the roof. Uh, and we had the power organizing module right underneath it. So the battery box is right above this. So our runs with those expensive thick copper cables are short. So we go straight down to the POM. Well, I was over there one day and then code requires that those battery cables be in these big fat stainless steel conduits and I went and looked at that and I said, damn, that looks expensive. And it was. It's about $2,000 worth of stuff to get the power from the batteries down to the power organizing module just to make it code. So I said, to hell with that. And we put the power organizing module up with the batteries. So then, boom, we're right there. And then all we have to do is take some light leads down to the remote readout display and the AC DC circuit breaker panels in the power cabinet. And that's uh, that's kind of where we're at now, except we have a better readout that is is just there showing you amps, watts, and volts. That's really all you need. You don't need all of this <coughs> other stuff <coughs> that the the um, <coughs> that they offer in these outback things. Have you was there six panels and eight batteries? How many bats? Of uh, electricity is giving. How many what? Per day. Per day. How many watts per day we can get of electricity? Which this six uh, solar panels <coughs> and eight batteries. Well, this is 450, 900, 1350 watts. Uh, and, uh, and you can add. We start out, now we use 250s, so we still have more power happening. We start out on a two-bedroom with six panels. <coughs> there is the box on the roof. Batteries going right to the system, and then lighter wires going down. <coughs> New Zealand tuberculosis is uh, coming. Came back from New Zealand with something and gave it to everybody. It wasn't BD either. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, that's our that's our unit, and it doesn't look like that anymore. It's evolved. <coughs> uh, if you look at the Lone Tree Building, you'll see a more simple one. Yeah. Um, the, so the refrigerator is one of the main draws from your tiles, is it not? Yeah. And I was wondering if you've ever come across, I mean, it seems like you've tried a lot of things. Have you ever come across a refrigerator that gives you the option to use outside air uh, when appropriate, like a thermostat, a leaking cold fan? It always seems weird to me to have like a fridge in your house in the winter using DC when it's cold outside and especially if that's using a lot of power like if you just have a duct we have one up at reach yeah so it's, it's a it's called a uh, uh, thermal mass refrigerator uh, I have drawings uh, pictures of it in one of these presentations it's a uh, uh, I don't know if I have it in here or not but it's a it's exactly what I said it's a big box you're exactly right if you came here from another planet and saw these people down here Heating a house with a nuclear power plant and then using another box inside to be cold and it's cold outside. And half the time it's, it's got a power plant in the sky. So <coughs> we made a big thermal mass box. And uh, lined it with insulation just like a house in thermal mass. Thermal mass was beer because it wouldn't freeze. Problem with it is people keep going up there and drinking the goddamn beer. <laughs> but uh, 
So it's beer, it's got a big insulated door, and it's got the same refrigeration unit that that's got on it. So in the summertime, you just switch over and use that. In the wintertime, it's got a duct that goes up to a skylight, and you have a gravity skylight. You open the skylight, I'll get you. You open the skylight, and, uh, and cool air is supposed to come down and freeze your hockey dots. Well, it didn't work. The reason it didn't work is you can't, air just doesn't move unless you create a situation of convection for it to move. So we had the refrigerator, this is an elevation of it now, here, big door, duct going up, skylight opening, and you open the skylight, and we expected the cold air to come right down there. Well, it got cool, but it didn't do jack. So, turned out we had a fireplace over here. You'll see it up there at Reach, you guys that are up there. Fireplace, when you burn the fire, the heat goes out. So we made a little duct from here over to the fireplace. Now you burn a fire, you open this skylight, and you're sucking frigid, 20 below zero air, combustion air, through your refrigerator, freezes the haagen works great. So, uh, and then, and then see, the winter, when the days are shorter, is when you have the least amount of sun. And that's when you want to take your refrigerator off your power system, and it works fine. That cold air gets the cans of beer, super, super cold, and they keep it cold all day long, and at night it gets charged up again, yeah. Well, MPPT charge controller is more efficient than the old versions. But they were for solar panels because they cost like six, 600, 800 800 bucks, yeah. So for the uh, survival pod, doesn't that make sense to get a cheaper, um, older version of the charge controller and more solar panels? Oh, well, for the survival pod, we have a one-room power system. We don't even use this power system. For the survival pod, we have a $1,000 power system, which I'll show you, which you haven't seen yet, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, the, yeah, all of these parts, yeah, that's, there's $800, there's a couple grand, there's, I mean, this whole system, when you get it all hooked up and working, it's like $27,000. We build it into the price of the Global Model Airship, but that's expensive. You, you, people that buy a Global Model Airship don't feel it because the price is still the same as a conventional home with everything. We've made that sort of obscure. But when you buy this for yourself, for some building that you've already built or something, it's $27,000 roughly, all hooked up and everything. And now this stuff is too expensive. For, so for the simple survival, I'll, I'll get there, but we have a really simple system that gives you lights, flushing your toilet, and charging your cell phone. And, it's simple, and maybe even charging your laptop some. So this is, we set these systems up like you all are doing over there. It took us a while to get uh, everybody to get their heads out of their asses, but uh, I, I believe we're hooked up now. No, maybe we're not. We're not because, oh yeah, the new company that we got instead of Outback makes us more simple, really nice, simple, a little bit less expensive uh, <coughs> converter, uh, but they sent us, the first one they sent us, uh, we got it at Lone Tree and we fell in love with it. It works great. So we got it one for that job and it came broken and so they sent it back and it came the wrong voltage and they sent it back. We get, in a few days we're supposed to have the right inverter over there to hook up to the uh, to the building you're building. But still it's, it's part of an expensive power system and uh, you, if, we, the, the, the global model airship is aimed at providing the same amenities in a home that a typical two-bedroom home in a subdivision hooked up to the power grid has. <coughs> so now, as a result of that conversation, we have a little smaller power cabinet that just has the circuit breakers in it. You can go over to the lone tree, open the door, and you see the two circuit breaker panels, and you see the little readout. It, you can read your amps. See, I always like to read, I always like, and you can read your watch. You don't have to do the formula and the math because I always forget which way it is anyway. You, you want to know amps, watts, and volts. If you're in a 24 volt system, then um, your voltage should always read, you know, 25 and better. If it's reading around 24, that means it's getting weak. Um, I mean, it'll still work and everything, but it, but you know, a 24 volt system <coughs> reads around 30, 29. 
if it's hot and happy. So, uh, wattage is what I like to read because I like to know at high noon <coughs> on a sunny day if I've got six 250s I should have 1500 watts and then I know if something if you go over there and look and you got 500 watts on a sunny day you know some of your panels aren't working so this is the schematic shop drawing battery box uh, power system component uh, POM and uh, it's insulated. This is just a shop drawing to build <coughs> this unit. There it is, and it's on every building. Mike, can I ask you a question about that building? Mm -hmm. It's got the, uh, the which the, building? That one? This one's got the solar chimneys on it. The greenhouses. Right? There. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that's what that detail was. This is the only picture we have of the convection skylights. This was in Georgia, so we needed to cool the building. And yeah, right behind there is a metal plate, and you can, you can it gets hot enough to fry eggs up there. And that drives the heat through the tubes. And see, in the normal around here buildings, we just have regular skylights. We don't have that aspect because we don't really need it here. But they were, they, they were, they're great. Uh, so the battery box, there it is. I, again, relate everything to the Global Model Earthship. Here's where the battery box sits on the Global Model Earthship. Everything is thought out in terms of what works and how does it all fit together in one building that does it all, and that's the Global Model Earthship. And there's the battery box on the top of the mountains in Wyoming. Mike, yeah. have you thought of putting the, because, like, Chris, when we did our power uh, lab, he said one of his biggest issues is when there's a problem with the batteries, you have to climb up on the icy roof, covered in snow, and, and walk up there and slip and slide and all that. Um, and I guess that's for code because you put it in a breezeway like the airlock or in the greenhouse, which isn't a living space for code. Well, uh, the, the, the problems with your batteries are very few and far between, number one. Number two, I want the batteries and the whole power system centrally located uh -huh. so that my runs don't get too long. And yeah. most places you don't want them in the house. A battery can blow up, so you really don't want it in the house. And uh, so centrally located, not wanting it in the house. I mean, this job we're going to do in Montana uh, is um, a pretty good sized house and has a huge garage. And... Uh, it does get butt-ass cold in Montana, and it's just a little too problematic to have the batteries not happy because they're too cold. So we are putting the battery box in the garage. I wouldn't put it in the airlock of one of these buildings. One, because it's at the end of the building. So, and, and see, the other thing is, if we want it, we can also steal some heat from that greenhouse just with a vent and get it up there. So what that means is, yeah, Chris is right. In the winter, if you have to go out there and mess with your batteries, you're up on that cold, snowy roof, but like I say, the amount of times you really have to do that after the system gets in place is very, very simple. How so, do you check your water levels though? You can put the little caps on the batteries that condense the water and take it right back down, and then you don't have to change your water. Once a year you have to check your water. So it is, uh, he's got a point, because he's the one that ends up going up there a lot, <laughs> but uh, my heart bleeds for it. <laughs> um, who else? Was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, actually, my question was pretty similar with the, with the batteries up in the cold space like that. Like, we're in Canada, so to me, you know, if it's minus 30 Celsius, those batteries can't, no amount of insulation without some sort of additional... <coughs> well, you can do two things. You can... See, we can get... We've done it before. We get a little hole in the top of the greenhouse roof that'll bring uh, air from the hot greenhouse up to the batteries. We'll double the insulation. And it can, it can be sufficient. No worries about condensation on the inside of the batteries? Or... Uh, there could be some condensation happen, but I mean, anytime you got, but see if, the, if you re, if you doubly insulate the battery box, then you've got a condensation break between the outside and everything anyway. So you can get heat from that greenhouse up to the battery box and just have it with a little hopper where you can open it in the wintertime and your greenhouse is heating your battery box. And that's not a bad deal. 
Uh, or you can put it in the garage like we're doing. <coughs> I don't like that because we're long. I like the power to be centrally located because we are using some DC, and the DC has fat wires, and it doesn't like long run. Yeah. Not to belabor, but could you put it below? Could you put it down in front of the tire wall or into the tire wall? Oh uh, yeah, you could put it down the low. Down and still, but see, it, 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 again, it's the the only thing we're doing is giving Chris a hard time because and, and the hell with him because um, <laughs> because if you put it down low, then you're back to a fifteen hundred dollar run to get the bat get it there. See, uh, well, no, you put the whole thing yeah, the whole down thing, low yeah, outside. You could do that probably, and then get in there. I'm sure the um, so and then, the yeah, and you you'd be on the south side. You could solar heat it a little. <laughs> That's not a, you know, we, we don't have the ultimate, ultimate application of everything. That's a thought, let's say, that could work. You've got to take it through your, it's just small wires that goes to your power cabinet. So it could go uh, out in front. I'm, I'm not, I'm, <clears throat> I can't think of a reason right now why that would be better than where we're showing it here. Less fluctuation so, in temperature. But, uh, uh, well, better in terms of access, too. So it's the only problem with putting it in um, the airlock is just the cost of wire. No, it's, uh, you don't want the batteries, a lot of places won't let you do that because mm -hmm. of code. It's in the building and it's, you can't have batteries. The gas... They're set out of the building in England, they're going to get stolen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we lock the battery boxes. They'd have to have a, you know, they'd have to have tools. <laughs> Of course they can. They yeah, all of them got. <laughs> yeah, the one, the building that we built in Brighton, England, everything got stolen. Yeah. Uh, right in the public park. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. All the power, all the power panels, and even batteries got stolen. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why you changed the? In the, in your old one of your old details in one of the books, it shows the old battery box you carved out. You built the whole. Organizing yeah, code, code. They keep changing code. They don't want batteries in the building for two reasons. One, they can blow up. Two, they off gas. They do off gas, and that's that, that's bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, Mike, there's. Uh, I know some places in Canada, there's uh, the code requires any new house being built has to have a an, a heat recovery ventilator or an energy <coughs> recovery ventilator. Is that an issue you had to address with the earth chips anywhere where because there's no force there, there's not really any active ventilation system except for in the summer when you have your convection engine going, but in the winter there's not really any way or that I noticed um, to circulate air in the place. Is that no, something you we haven't had to deal with it. Uh, because in a solar building, see, they're wanting you to heat, have a heat recovery. I believe this is the way the rice now. They're wanting you to have heat recovery because um, because you're heating with fuel. When you're heating with sun, you know. It, 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 but, it, well, I mean, part of what the heat recovery ventilator uh, accomplishes is, is circulation. Yeah. And the whole, it exhausts stale air from bathrooms and kitchens and then. But we'll vent these them. houses in. A sunny day in December, yeah. even in Canada. We, they, that greenhouse, you open it up. The, the buildings are, are vented pretty much year-round. You, I mean, you'll in the dead of winter, you'll close off the, the outside door on the tubes and just vent the skylights and crack, and that, get, that gets a cold air drop. And, and you do get still some movement of air because it still sucks the air out. You can even you can open up the uh, uh, skylights and open up the doors and on a sunny day, you got air moving. The only time you really close these buildings up is when you got six cloudy days in a row. Then you do close them up. And and uh, so, you, but you don't have months and months of a closed up building. Uh, on batteries, we we used to use the golf cart batteries, but they're only good for about five years. And we wanted to go a little bit longer. I didn't want it. These are twenty year batteries, but battery technology is evolving so much that. We, we didn't want to be stuck with batteries for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got these 12, 15 year batteries, uh, L16s. They're what we use now. They're a little easier to handle than these. Of course, these could have, I think these are the ones we had in Brighton, though, and they got stolen. So <laughs> it takes four people to carry one of those. Uh, so there's a diagram that we put out. I believe we put this diagram out with our drawings. 
of our, our, you know, just the schematic of the power system. Now, so then you get a wiring diagram on a global model airship. And I started, I got to stop showing this because I don't like it. But we have three wiring diagrams. One is the plugs, the AC plugs. They're just code required every 11 feet, whatever. Um, and they go home running to the, to the circuit breaker panel for AC. Then we have a, a, two more wiring diagrams. This is two in one, really. We have the AC lighting, and then we have the DC. And so every, all the lighting in this hallway is DC. The rationale there is that if the inverter breaks, you can light up the whole house with the hallway. And then we have the water pump from the, on the water module, DC refrigerator, and gray water pump. Then, if the inverter breaks, which it can, and, and I've had that happen a lot, everything in the house works. And that's a good, that's a good place to be in. Yeah? What's the reason to have any AC lighting? And not well, uh, AC, the lighting industry, the light bulb industry, is just all over the place. And there for a while, and still... It's easier to find AC, LED, Edison-based light bulbs than any other kind of LED light bulb. And so, I mean, I basically follow the uh, cleaning girls on the nightly rentals. Like, they, uh, you know, they're going crazy. Okay, well, where do I, I'm using an LED, AC, 24-volt. You know, they, they got too many different kinds of light bulbs to try and get. You can't, some of them, you'll, you'll be able to get if you can't already, AC, Edison-based LED light bulbs in Walmart or a builder supply store. So we want to offer that for people. We do this so that they'll still have a life when, when the inverter breaks, but you have to order 24 volt DC LED light bulbs. You can't get them as easily. So we're trying to follow what is user-friendly uh, and it could change, but right now that's the most user-friendly situation. Yeah. If you put a door or, or an entry system or something mm -hmm. parallel with the self-facing glass, but um, in line with the main strong back wall there, um, to stop the humidity from going into your airlock, would that not solve the problem instead of having to put an extra door system here? here. Well, we could say that again. You put it here. Yeah. Yeah. You could close this off. And it would help. Uh, from this extreme, what happens is this extreme heat gets in here. This cools down after the sun moves. And so now you've got uh, th this, this area cools down. So it's still super cold here, super hot here. It just runs like a river. So if you block this off, that would begin to do it. Uh, it, would, it would reduce it, let's say. But really... You basically, the idea is these vaults, they're nice looking, but they just shade it even more. They're great for the summer. The real thing, the real solution is just do another one right out here. And then, then when you get into that, is the view worth that that much? It takes, you know, you've got a $20,000 bill in the end of your house there. So this is what I mean by Edison-based. Edison-based is the screw-in bulb. People get, I've been doing it for a long time and decades. <coughs> And you got all these bulbs, like these track lights, and they they fit in. You know, they're funny how they fit in. And then you got so many different kinds of bulbs with so many different kinds of receptacles. I'm blowing off all of that stuff. This is what people can operate. They screw in a light bulb. You know, how many how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? You know, so uh, um, what they say, one to turn the bulb, and uh, the other to turn the world, or something like that, or hold the bulb. But anyway, it's uh, Edison-based AC LED. It's really, you have to think to keep up with it. That's the easiest LED light bulb to get. And by the way, LEDs are just, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, most people do by now. It was just the, the incandescent light bulbs that were in the market, on the market and in the stores. They're pretty much outlawed right now in some states because they use so much power. Then... They got the halogen ones. They were maybe, you know, 10, 15% more efficient. And then they got the, and, and, and they're hot, and they're, they're a little bit more efficient, but they never really got off the ground. They got some of them. Then 
Compact fluorescents, uh, seriously more efficient, I don't know, 50%, 40% more efficient, at least 50% more efficient. But they're full of mercury, and they're not good. And they're cold, but then they got them warm, light. But then they came along with LEDs. They were really pissy at first, but they're getting them to look and operate and, and be warm light and be just about as much. And they use a fraction. Like I'm trying to get all the buildings over to LED bulbs because that just makes the power system twice as good. Because normally it's bulbs that run a power system down. People leaving lights on. Well, hell, I don't even care if you leave lights on with LED bulbs. Just like I don't care if you waste, if you flush your toilet. You know, they got the whole thing. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Well, that's disgusting. But um, it's, I don't care in a, in a global model airship because I'm flushing with used water. So I don't care with LED bulbs if somebody leaves a light on because it's just a teeniest amount of power. It actually doubles the power system uh, to have LED bulbs. And they look just pretty much the same as regular bulbs. So uh, that's an LED bulb chandelier. So uh, uh, common combination of wind and sun then in concept. <clears throat> The POM that we make, make will take power from wind and sun. These, are, these things are great. They are noisy. People don't like them anywhere near the house. And they just, whenever there's a wind, it drives you nuts. Plus, they just break. You know, they're, they're nice, but they're a pain in the ass. And so, and, and the whole windmill thing, <coughs> that's uh, up on top of Peekery's Peak here, the KTL radio station. I think I showed you this. That's a little airship right there to keep their equipment above 50 degrees without fuel. And that's their, it was fun going up there. And, and I was, see, Pika Reese is that mountain over there. And Reach is that mountain there. So when we were building the first Reach buildings, we were also building this radio station over there. So my job was to ride my motorcycle up to Reach, check everything out there, and then ride it down the mountain, across the mesa, and up that mountain, and check everything out there. So I just basically rode my motorcycle all day long. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we take the power systems and lay them out on the ground or hang them up on a tree and run a job with it. This is in Jamaica. And hook the batteries up and just, we, we take the power, and now that we got it in the box, why, well, we just take the box and set it out there like you, like you have at your job, only your inverter's not working. Um, but we, in the tropics, we did a little uh, systems shack, we called it, and it was everything. The power modules on one side, this is H of framing, power module, water module, backup hot water heaters, pressure tank, backup propane tank, everything in this little shack. And uh, it was kind of cool uh, to just put power, put, put utilities up and then build a building with the utilities. It worked pretty good. Um, it, it's only smart for the tropics, and it, it did do, do the job in the tropics. We used it quite a few times. Um, there's how it works. It's, you put it in the middle of two bungalows, and they both get power and water and hot water and everything from it. And uh, it, was, it was a reasonable uh, idea for utilities. Um, and like I say, we used it quite a bit. So it has each, each side, it has a, one side's water, one side's power, one side's gas. And you're seeing the same power module that we were using up until recently. And if you look in the, the latest power module that we've got is in uh, the battery box at the Lone Tree House. So, and we're phasing out about back, and we're definitely phasing out of that thing. And, uh, so that is our utility shack for the for the tropics, really. That was Bonaire. Uh, now, so uh, yeah, uh, battery technology, uh, sizing, uh, dimensions. I mean, and manufacture. Does that matters for uh, different Earthship projects like the the uh, survival and the global? Well, I'm I'm at the survival right now. That. The battery technology for the global is beefy 
batteries that will run refrigerators and run a whole house. And, and we have played with all different sizes and ranges of, of uh, uh, charge cycle and everything, deep cycle. And those L16s that I showed a picture of are where we're at, state of the art, for the present time for the global model airship. Battery technology is evolving uh, as we speak because of electric cars, so there'll probably be some more expensive, longer lasting, um, lighter or whatever batteries on the market soon. But for the simple survival, it's just a whole different concept. It's this battery, this, is, this brings us to this part. Um, the simple survival doesn't, we, we, because you need so much to meet codes and regulations, you have to do a $27,000 power system. Simple survival is, first of all, screw regulations, because we recommend building them under the radar and, and wherever you're building them. You, the building of simple survival will pass codes, but the systems won't because they're too abbreviated. But the thing is, what we learned in Haiti and uh, Sierra Leone and, and India and all the places we went, uh, the, you do not need for survival. We're talking simple survival. What do you need? Do you need a refrigerator like that for simple survival? Do you need a flat screen TV for simple survival? No. For simple survival, I'm talking about just getting off the streets and not sleeping on a park bench, but not having a mortgage payment. So what we have de determined in our own minds from the third world countries where they do exist on simple survival, 14 in a tent with nothing, uh, is they need a couple of LED lights. Well, that's nothing. They need a pump to give them flush toilet. That's not that much. And every, every third world country I've ever been to, every one of them's got a cell phone. And they charge, you know, they buy minutes. and So they need to be able to charge their cell phone. And some of them have a stolen laptop. So they need to be able to charge their laptop. So um, those are the things of simple survival. And that's what we tried to do a mock-up over here. We're still evolving every aspect of it. But that little system over there, I believe Chris has doubled your batteries now. So are you all functioning over there with your power system? Yeah. yeah. You're charging cell phone. Yeah. You're flushing your toilet. Yeah. And you are having a couple lights. You're alive. I mean, he's alive. <laughs> so that's all we're trying to do with simple survival is keep somebody alive. But it's actually better than just being alive. I mean, they're comfortable in terms of comfort temperature. And um, they have a greenhouse with plants growing in it. They have a shower. They should have a warm shower, a uh, couple of them. Uh, they got three people over there, so, you know, tough shit on that. But um, anyway... Simple survival is just taking the whole thing and downsizing life. You know, I get so many people, they don't, I don't know, if, have I talked about simple survival that much? I don't think I have. Yeah. Uh, I forget where and when I've said whatever. Uh, but the whole thing with simple survival is way downsizing life. And then, you know, because there's so many people that are just, I mean, even in, you know, I talk about the 17% in the de undeveloped countries and the 83 in the developed countries. Well, somebody here, I believe, pointed out, or somebody recently pointed out, well, of that 83% of people in the developed world, half of them can't afford a mortgage payment either. So there's a lot of people, more than half the people on this planet, can't deal with the conventional $400,000 mortgage. Um, so you have to have a way of life, and you put that together with what we call pockets of freedom, areas where you can build with a home for yourself without a permit or minimal permit. And you have this simple survival concept and this is the simple survival power system diagram. We built them in... What happened? Huh. Huh. <coughs> we built them and put them in little Walmart toolboxes and a little thin film solar panel that you can roll up, transport, and in cases roll up to hide when you're not there or whatever. Uh, then we, so that's how we were doing them, and I think we're evolved away from this now because there's labor in messing with all of this, uh, turning the toolbox into a one-room power system. The first ones we took uh, to Belize, I think, the crew had got held up in <coughs> Dallas, I believe, 
because they thought it was a bomb. <laughs> and so now we have found this little device on the market. It is, it is a car charger. It's got its battery cables there. It, it's just designed 